Everybody, it's a huge, wonderful, wonderful honour for me to be here today in your presence. I think if I've got any talent in life, it's to fall in with a good crowd. I'm very lucky with my family, with my friends. There's a mass of them up there in the stalls. But also just the feeling here tonight, what a wonderful body of people just to be amidst all of you. So thank you. Firstly, I'll acknowledge my ancestral mountain, Taranaki, or Egmont as it was known when I was young. I dedicate the short poem that follows, not only to my late cousin Stephen, but to all the Fano, the Hickeys and O'Briens, from whom I descend and with whom I coexist in the present. My poem, with its ancestral chariot, the Holden Tirana, and its founts of small town wisdom, everybody's picture theatre and the Enterprise bookshop, might offer a set of originating coordinates for the thoughts that follow. Taranaki. In memory, Stephen Hickey. I have no breath but yours, nor as many words. The orchard, a tumble of fruit. The mountain, again, in its lava of cloud. Surf cast or reeled in, the sun in a white bait net. Or waylaid, mid-afternoon, between everybody's and the enterprise. And the mountain, always on your shoulder. At a Tirana gone around the clock, near new moon on its bonnet, long line and lure, beach break and unquilted mountain, wayward one. The, the endeavour that most defines me is poetry. Maybe I was destined to choose a vocation beginning with the letter P. My Irish forebears were, to a man, pig farmers, policemen, publicans, and my volatile great-grandfather, Cockatoo Hickey, who washed up in Opanaki, became a renowned pugilist, the bare-knuckle champion of South Taranaki. Carrying on with the letter P, my brother Brendan, who's here, became a printer. My sister Justine spent serious time as a pianist in hotel lounges. In terms of careering options, the family appears to be confined to some kind of P lab an alphabetical vocational as opposed to a chemical one. Myself, I married another poet. Not always a good idea, but in this case, a superlative choice, Jenny Bornhold. Of our sons, Jack Marcel became a policy analyst and, after hours, photographer. Felix is a pianist, fourth year of the Sydney Conservatorium. And our third son, Carlo, aged 18, is presently angling around other letters of the alphabet before he no doubt fixes upon his inevitable profession, beginning with P. <laughs> From our mother Margaret, my siblings and I inherited a sense of the interconnectedness of things, especially people. We were brought up in the belief that we were related to the entire Taranaki province. Everyone was described as a cousin. The Hickeys of Upanaki, the Hurleys of Pangarehu, the Titos of Tinamu, all through my life, mum has telephoned to convey vital information, often grisly deaths involving distant relations whose names I have never even heard before. <laughs> Sixty years after leaving Taranaki to live in Auckland and now Wellington, it is as if, as if our mother, at some deep subliminal level, still owns and runs the province of her birth. The keeper of the knowledge, it is as if she has never left home. When I told Mum, who's here tonight, about receiving the Doctor of Literature Award, she swiftly counted that Aunt Mary made it there first, beating me by a thumping 92 years. <laughs> Mary Hickey, aka Sister Domatilla of the Mission Sisters, first born in the thatched Okanaki Whare of the aforementioned pugilist, was the first woman in New Zealand to be honoured with such a degree from Canterbury University <clears throat> in 1925. I double-checked. If my sense of the interconnectedness of nigh on everything comes from my mother, from my father I inherited the great, great virtue of bookishness and an Irishness far too complex and unruly to talk about here. Alongside this genetic preconditioning, I've long subscribed to the idea that you invent your ancestors as much as you inherit them, <clears throat> and that is where university enters the picture. It was during my three years at Auckland University the lives and works of a number of artists and writers opened up to me. Shakespeare, Blake, Yeats, Joyce, John Berger, Colin McCann, Janet Frame, Ralph Hortery, B. 
Bill Manhire, Robin White. They made me who I am, so I claim them. <clears throat> we often hear that the youth of today are very slow to leave home. They linger for years, decades even, endlessly shuttling between childhood, bedroom, kitchen, fridge and sofa. In Italy and Chile, according to various reports, the average male doesn't leave home until he's 37. As parents, we might well feel obliged to evict these ne'er-do-wells for their own good. But are these homebodies really such a problem? I would like to speak briefly in praise of not leaving home, in praise of hanging on, refusing to go. Although in this case, the home I'd like us all to not be leaving is the house of learning, the university, a place that, if it has done its job well, should have become by now the intellectual and spiritual home of each of us. <clears throat> when I graduated BA from Auckland University in 1984, I never made it more than a few metres down the road. In hindsight, I think of my trajectory outwards as that of a horizontal bungee jumper. I am still rebounding. Within a few months, I was back there illustrating a book by poet C.K. Stead for Auckland University Press. There were readings, conversations, publications, a literary journal called Rambling Jack launched at the English Department Common Room, an occasional meal with Carl or, or Bill Pearson or Dennis McEldowney across the road at the hotel referred to enigmatically as the Big I. Although I never enrolled in another course, I have continued to raid the academic fridge for provisions in the 33 years since graduating. Universities are a far broader community than their tenured staff and enrolled students. You'll know this soon enough. For decades now, I have been generously plied with sustenance of many kinds, not only from the realms of English literature and art history, my majors. Like my mother's province of Taranaki, the university is a place where all of us are connected and where new connections are forever being made. It is an immensely subtle space of collaboration, communion, and ongoing conversation across different territories. Perhaps it could most accurately be described as an atmosphere. Remember this, your chosen field isn't a fixed address or set of parameters. It is a magic carpet. Since holding the Writing Fellowship here in Wellington in 1995, another bungee-like cord has attached me to Victoria, where I've taught creative writing, researched, designed book covers, been published by VUP, and drunk an amount of coffee in the hub, roughly equivalent to Wellington Harbour. I acknowledge my very good friends in Victoria, many of whom are here tonight, with a special mention of Lydia Weavers, Richard Hill, and everyone at the Stout Research Centre where I have just spent two exhilarating, improving, broadening years. I also acknowledge another institution which has been a huge force in my life and ongoing education, the City Gallery Wellington and its inspired former director, Paula Savage. <clears throat> I will conclude by celebrating the great potential of the university to explore human life and what lies within, beyond and around it. That for me is why the word university is nestled up so closely to the related word universe. It means the study of everything, the state of being alive, of looking in every direction, of being curious and open to wonder. When human beings think it is the universe thinking its thoughts, that point was made by the mathematician poet Lars Gustafsson. In a parallel fashion, you could say the university is a society thinking its thoughts, sorting out its priorities. A university should never be reduced to a trade school or technical institute for the professions. Neither should it ever be labelled a service provider and its students' clients. According to the 1990 Education Act, our universities are charged with, amongst other things, being society's critic and conscience. How heartening it is to see so many people here tonight graduating in the humanities. The vet state of the world is a constant reminder of how essential the humanities are to the well-being of our society, our cultures, 
and possibly even our species. If Donald Trump had a thorough knowledge of Shakespeare's plays, I have no doubt he would make an infinitely better president. Has there ever been a time in history when we've been more in need of dynamic, insightful work in such fields as religious studies? In an era characterised by doubt, anxiety and stress, we need the arts generally not to fill an ornamental function, but to complete who we are. As together we become more profoundly a part of this archipelago of Aotearoa, New Zealand, we also acknowledge the status of Māori and other Pacific peoples as our older, wiser siblings in this oceanic realm. In that contact text, I thank and celebrate this university, this universe of human thinking, seeing, feeling and being, this home we carry with us, this well-stocked refrigerator, this marae of such things as we care deeply about, this wānanga, this university on the hill, another ancestral mountain for all of us here tonight 